Hi, everyone. I'm Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. And I also work at Mozilla. Of course, we make the Firefox browser. But you might not know, we have a few other browser projects in the works at the moment, too. And one of them uses React. So I was working on this project. I was hacking on it. And I thought, I should really dive more deeply into React's internals to see how it's doing things so that I can make our project more performant. And what happened when I did that is I had to step through the virtual DOM algorithm over and over and over and over and over and over again. And so I figured as long as I had gone through that process, I might as well write it down and turn it into a cartoon so that other people could share the benefit of that. So that is what started this talk. I'm going to be focusing on the performance, what you can do to make your React apps more performant. And I should start by saying that I'm not going to be telling you anything that you don't already know. I'm going to be talking about things like keys and should component update and immutability. The reason I wanted to talk about them, though, is because I think that we often have this fuzzy concept of the ideas around performance. And we don't really take the time to bring those concepts into focus. So this means that the knowledge about these ideas is just received knowledge. You know, you just add a should component update because somebody told you on, was standing on a stage and they told you to do that. But not all recommendations work the same in all situations. So I want to bring these concepts around performance into focus so that you can have a better understanding of the why behind each recommendation. And I should also say, before I start, that I'm focusing on a very specific part of, render perfor of performance in React, and that is performance during the render cycle. So other things that you can do to make React more performant are things like, if you're in production, use the production version of React, those kinds of things. Those have a huge impact, and a lot of people slip up and don't realize that they're doing that. Um, but I'm not going to talk about those little gotchas. So the talk's going to go a little something like this. First, I'm going to talk about the basics of rendering in the browser, so how the browser actually renders your web page and what parts of that can possibly be slow. And then I'm going to talk about what React does to minimize and batch DOM changes with the virtual DOM to make it a little bit faster. And then I'm going to cover what you can do to make React even faster than that. So let's start with number one how the browser builds your web page, how it actually renders the page, and what parts are slow. And you can kind of think of this in the same way that you think of developing the website yourself. So there's work that takes place over time, and there's an initial period of work. This would be before the initial launch, if you were developing you know, in the development process. And in React, this is the initial render. And then there are updates that happen after that. So in, if you were working on a project, that would be any feature updates. If you're working in React, that is going to be something like this.setState, updating the UI. To extend this metaphor, your code is kind of like the project lead, planning the project and telling folks what to do. Unfortunately, your code only has one person working on this project for it, and that's the main thread. So the main thread is kind of like a JavaScript developer. It, or sorry, it's kind of like a full stack developer. It covers JavaScript, the DOM, and layout. And just as when you're working on a project in real life, if you only have one person working on the project, you're going to limit the number of tasks that you assign to that one person if you want that project to be delivered on time. But before we know how to reduce the amount of work that the main thread is doing, we need to know more about the work that the main thread does. So as I mentioned before, the main thread is in charge of JavaScript. So this is, you know, you're familiar with JavaScript. This is where you define your functions, where you call functions. The DOM is the way the functions tell the page what to do. Basically, the DOM gives you a set of objects that you can move around and manipulate in order to change what the browser is rendering. And the way that this works is that there's something behind the scenes called the render tree. And so the main thread combines the DOM with CSS to create the render tree. And it figures out a thing from that called the box model. And this is what it passes off to the thing that actually passes the pixels to the page. This whole process is called a reflow. And that computation takes a bit of time. 
So the main thread doesn't do it on every single DOM change. Instead, what it tries to do is batch those changes together so that it can cover more of them in a single pass through computing the render tree. So the way this works is, you know, your code might say, change the class name on that button, and then the main thread goes over and does it. And then add a div, the main thread goes over and does it. And then add another button, the main thread goes over and does it. The main thread will also have made a note to itself. Sometime in the future, I need to recalculate that render tree. And so when that time in the future comes, it's going to go over to the render tree and calculate all of those things together. So we want to reduce the amount of work that the main thread is doing here. You might have figured out two good ways. One way is to reduce the number of DOM changes. And another way is to batch those DOM changes together in time so that the main thread can take care of all that recalculation on the same reflow. And this is something that React helps you do. Now, I want to be clear. React isn't the only way to do this. It's actually not even a necessary way of doing this. These ideas have been around since well before React. So it's not that React is necessarily more performant than vanilla JavaScript. The thing is, in order to get these performance gains, your code has to be smart. Your code needs to know how to direct the main thread pretty precisely to do these things. So go back to the metaphor. Your code needs to be both a really, really good product manager. It needs to know what to display in this web page. And it also needs to be a really, really good tech lead. It needs to know how to build the page in the most efficient way. Of course, your code is only as smart as you make it. So that means that all of the developers on your team have to have a really solid understanding of how these things work together. And they need to not be prone to making mistakes. They always need to be on their game, on top of their game. So what React does for you is it offloads that work. It's kind of like your code brings in a consultant to do all of the tech lead work. And that frees up your code just to be a good product manager so that your code can just focus on what needs to be displayed, not on how to make it happen. So let's take a look at how these two, React and your code, work together to direct the main thread in shipping. And I won't be showing the main thread through the rest of the slides, but just assume wherever you're seeing work being done, the main thread is there. So this brings us to part two, how React minimizes work using the virtual DOM. And I'm going to start this off with a UI that we're going to build. So this UI is just a list of numbers. And when you click the button, the numbers multiply by itself. So let's walk through the initial render on this. I'm going to start from the very beginning. A user has downloaded some HTML, and it's been parsed. And there is an HTML element that's going to serve as the container for the React app. And your code has been loaded, and React has been loaded. And along with your code, these things called components have been loaded. And so these are kind of like deputy product managers that know about specific parts of the page and what they should render. And in case you aren't familiar, this is what code that corresponds to. React DOM dot render. And then the first parameter is list. That's going to as a React element. And then the second parameter is the HTML container that we were just talking about. So we covered that HTML container. But what is the React element? It's a way for your code to hand off requirements to React, to tell React what needs to be displayed. So following the analogy, it's like a little note card that has a few notes about what React needs to build. It has the type, which is the component that's going to be used to build the thing, and it has the props and children. And React's going to hold on to this element. It's just going to tuck this note card away until it's ready to build the thing. The thing that it builds using these specs, using this, these requirements, is an instance of the component. So an instance is the thing that holds on to the state. It's the thing that you call this dot set state on. It's the thing that holds on to the refs. It's the thing that React uses to figure out whether or not it needs to update the DOM. But you don't actually interact with instances too much. You don't need to manage instances. React manages the instances for you. You just need to give it these requirements in the form of elements. So your code asks for an element, and React creates it. And then your code tells React to start rendering. This is React DOM.render. Your code tells React to start rendering that element into the container. 
And this begins construction of React's render tree. Now, if you don't follow, I'm going to have to move through this pretty quickly. Uh, but this is being recorded, so you can catch up on it there. And if you want a version of this for yourself, uh, I've posted it on Twitter, both uh, Lynn Clark and Code Cartoon, so you can go there and download a version of this. I should stay, say before I start going through this algorithm, it has changed. It actually has changed since I started writing this talk, and it will change again. There are some pretty big changes to this algorithm in the pipeline currently. But for now, this is how it works. So React starts by creating this thing called a top-level wrapper. And it's just a little implementation detail. It makes it easier for React to wrap up some stuff together. Then it creates an instance of that top-level wrapper. And it sets it so that when it calls render on that top-level wrapper, it's going to render to the list. This is the React element that was passed in, which has now been instantiated. So it sets the props and state on the list. And then it wants to create the corresponding DOM for the list. But unfortunately, it doesn't know how. You know, if this were a div, React knows about divs. It knows what DOM it needs to create for a div React element. It needs to create a div HTML element. But since this is something that it doesn't know about, it's going to have to ask. So it asks the component, and list responds, OK, well, I'm going to need you to create some elements for me. I need you to create a button element. And I need you to create, for each thing that's in my this.state.items list, I need you to create an item element. And then I need you to create a div to wrap all of those. So React takes all those elements, builds them out, and then tucks them away. And the only one that it cares about right now is that wrapping div. So it'll pull that out of the pile and create the instance for that. And because this is a div, it knows what DOM it needs to create for the div. So it goes over to the DOM and creates that. Now note, it didn't actually make that div a child of the container that's there. That would have scheduled that reflow. Instead, what it wants to do is wait until all of the nodes are there before it schedules that reflow. So now, to do that, to get all those DOM nodes there, it's going to need to create instances of all of the children. And for this, it goes from a complex to a simple structure. It goes from this uh, nested array into an object. And that object has property names that correspond to the structure of that array. So the first item is dot zero. The, the name of the first item is dot zero. And that's because the button was the zeroth item in that array. Now the items, they have more complex names because they're in a nested structure. So dot one dot zero is the first item, dot one dot one is the second item. So React takes this flattened list and creates the instances from that. Now it's time to make the DOM elements. So React knows how to create the DOM for a button, and it goes over and does that. Then it gets to the items. And once again, these are things that it doesn't know how to create the DOM for, so it has to ask again. And so the item's going to say, OK, I need you to create a div element and take the prop that was passed into me and turn that into text content. So React creates the element, and then the instance, and then the DOM node. And it does this two more times to get that full set of DOM nodes. Then it goes over to the DOM, and it wires up all of those children to their parent, and then hooks up the wrapper div to the container div. And this is what's going to trigger that reflow. But you notice that it waited to the end to trigger that. That's that batching that I was talking about before. That way, the main thread can handle these changes all at once. So we get our UI, and it's ready for people to interact with it. Let's see how the, how the virtual DOM actually handles that user interaction. So the user's going to click the button. And React figures out the on-click handler for the click. And it does this using something called event delegation. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into what event delegation is, but you can find an explanation of it in the React docs. So from there, it calls the handler. And the handler would be code like this. You, know, you get a list of items from the state, perform operations on the items, then call set state with the items. And if you think that you see a possible bug with this code, we're going to get to that later. So the handler would have been defined 
in the list component, and it would have been bound to the list instance. When it calls this dot set state, it calls set state on that list instance. So what happens when set state is called? What React does is it sets up a few different lists. It takes the partial state that was passed in with this dot set state, and it adds it to an array on the instance of pending state changes. And then it takes that instance and it adds it to this thing called the dirty components array. And these are all of the things that are going to need to be updated, but it doesn't take care of those yet. It waits to see if that click handler might have done any other things, might have set state on any other instances, before it actually starts processing this. Once it's figured out if there have or haven't been any other updates, it goes through and it flushes this queue. And since list is the only thing on this queue, this is the only thing that we're gonna process. So we start with the instance that had set state called and work down from there. And I'm just graying everything out. React holds on to all of these things so it can do comparisons between the previous and the next. Um, but this will make it easier for you to see what's going on. So React calculates the next state on the instance and sets that. And then it has to ask the component, okay, now that you have this new state, what are you gonna render to now? And so the component responds and it creates the new elements, the new set of elements that it would render to. And from there it updates the instances and then it compares the instances, the previous instances to the new ones and figures out whether or not it needs to make DOM changes. So for the button, it doesn't need to make any DOM changes because the button hasn't changed at all. Then it gets to the first item, and it's gonna have to ask the item again, what do you render to, before it figures out whether or not item is, has changed or not. So item responds, it creates the element for that, updates the div instance, and since there were no changes, you know, in the previous list it was one, in the new list is one, that text content hasn't changed, it figures it can save a little work by not going over to the DOM, not making any changes to the DOM for that. So then, for the second one, it has to go through that same process. It updates the instance and figures out, actually, there is a change between these two. So it goes over to the DOM and makes the change. And then it does the same thing for the third one. And that's when you get that reflow. Because those two happened in um, pretty quick succession, they probably hit the same reflow. So this is how React makes things faster. It figures out the smallest number of changes that it needs to make to the DOM and it batches them all together so that the browser can do a smaller number of reflows. But there's still a good amount of work happening here. So how could we reduce this? And this brings us to the third part of the talk, which is what you can do to make React faster. And the first technique is one that you probably already know because React yells at you if you don't do it. Um, whenever you're creating an array of children, it's going to tell you that you should be using keys for those children. So I want to show you why this can help your performance. To do this, I'm going to need to switch up my example. Um, we're going to be, we're going to have a list of fruits in alphabetical order, and when you click the button, they're going to reverse order. So we've gotten part of the way through the set state process. This is where it starts to get interesting. This is where uh, React is actually dealing with the children, those items that have changed order. So if you remember when it was flattening them, it was turning that nested array into a flat object and assigning these property names. And from that it updated the instance of, instances of the children and then compared the old instances to the new instances. Let's look more closely at how that comparison happens. So React's looking at the old um, set and the new set. And it's going to look at the two things that have the same name. So uh, .1.0 and .1.0 in each of these lists. So the name is just the index of the array. And we reverse the order. This means that React is comparing apples to oranges, quite literally in this case. Apple was at position zero before and now oranges. So when it compares these two lists, it thinks it needs to update the values of all of the items that are in the list, except for the middle one, 
because they all look different than they used to. Now let's say that we had given React meaningful keys, something like the actual name of the fruit. The key would then be used in that name, and then React can tell which of the previous instances corresponds to which of the next instances. And it can tell that nothing but changed change but the order. So it would know that I can just reorder those DOM nodes. Now in this case, it's not a huge difference. But just imagine if each of these were a complex DOM structure. That could be a real time savings, only moving them around instead of recreating them. But it's only really a time savings if your list is gonna be reordered. Like if you're going to reverse the order or take something out of the middle of the array. If you aren't changing the order, then there's no real performance impact to this. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to understand the why behind any recommendation. Because recommendations don't always have the same impact across different use cases. So let's look at a use case where this adding keys wouldn't have as much of a performance impact, but where another trick would. So it's a list where items are being fetched from a server and added to the end of a list. And let's say the user pushes the button, but there are no new messages. So React's gonna go through the entire process of building out this render tree, of building out the elements and the instances and everything. But it's not gonna change anything in the DOM. So this is called wasted time. You can see it in React Perf tools. And how can we avoid wasting time like this? I'm sure you've heard of one way, and that's should component update. What happens is when the user clicks and this dot set state is called, before building up the render tree below the list, React will ask the component a question. It'll say, if I give you these next props and next state, do you need an update? And then the list will say, no, I'm good. So React won't call render or do anything else on that component or its children. So this is great because we can skip computing the list and everything under it. We can save a whole lot of processing there. But if you were looking closely at that should component update, you might have noticed a potential bug. And this works hand in hand with the potential bug I was calling out in the handler before. It depends on how you're updating the state. So let's say that you were updating it the way that I was saying, where you set a new variable next items to this.state.items, and then you push an item on the array, and then call set state with that next items variable. What would happen here is that you'd never see the new items rendered in your UI. Your should component update would always return false. Why is that? It's because even though you have two names for this thing, they're both pointing at the same object, the exact same thing. And when you do an equals check in JavaScript, on object variables, it just checks that the two variables point to the same object. So even if you make a change, the should component update is going to think that the old state and the new state are the same. So it's not gonna see this change. Now you could make it so that whenever you do call that handler, whenever you are calling um, this outset state, what you're doing is creating a new object from the old one, using something like object assign. Then your should component update would see that the previous and the new one are different. The problem is it would think that there was always something that was different between them because it was always pointing to a new object. So it would never return false. Your should component update would be completely ineffective. Now you could do a deep equality check where you compare the actual values. But depending on how heavy that is, it might actually take more time. So it'd be nice to have that simple, quick qualities check, but still catch changes in the data. And this is what immutability gives you. So with immutable data, if two variables are pointing to the same object, you know that the data hasn't changed. And if it does need to change, you create a new object. So if you're using immutable data, then you can do these quick equality checks, which are fast and should component update. So with should component update, you can short circuit work lower in the tree than the place where you called this dot set state. But what if the change happens in one of the children? Do you still need to compute this whole set of things? Let's walk through that case. 
So we have a to-do list, and we check off one of the items. That item has to change, but the rest of the list, the other items in the list and the list itself, they don't really need to change. So how can you make sure that you aren't updating those other things? When you're using vanilla React with local component state, it's actually pretty easy. You just restructure your state so that you can call set state lower in the tree. But when you're using something like Redux, this can be harder to do. That's because you're firing off actions, and then the state is coming in through connect. And most people will use connect at the top level of their tree, or many people will. There is a way to do this, though. And that's using connect at lower levels of the tree. Now, if you're going to do this, you'll probably need to rethink how you're handling your data for this to work. Because you'd have a component structure like this, and most people would pass in their array of items to the list, and then those would be passed down to each item um, component. So when an item needs to be changed, it not only needs to change in the item itself, but also in the array that's being passed to list. So that's triggering, triggering an update at the list level. But you can reduce the work here. And the way you do that is by passing in IDs to the list, and then passing those IDs down to the items. And from there, you can actually use the ID and map, um, map state to props to convert that ID into the item. And so then, when the item is changed, you only see that change in the item itself. So this is how you can save on work at higher levels and sibling levels of the tree. I wish I had time to cover other performance tricks, things like memoization and virtualization and incremental rendering, and how you could use observables, which things like MobX and Relay use to notify components of changes. But this is going to have to be it for now. So here are the techniques that we covered. Um, using keys to help React match previous instances to new ones. Using should component update to short circuit the work lower in the tree, and how immutability factors into that. And using set state or connect lower in the tree so they can reduce work higher in the tree. So I hope this has given you a good overview of a few starting points. As you can see, there are lots of tweaks that you can make. Some of them are right for some cases, some of them are right for other cases, and some actually have negative impacts if they're used in the wrong way in the wrong circumstances. So this is why people say it's good to measure. And hopefully this talk has given you a fr good framework for understanding what it is that you're measuring. Thank you. <laughs>